Um, welcome everyone to this next session. If you've ever done a lit search into compression, the name of our next presenter will be entirely familiar to you. And I must confess, I have a bit of a girl crush <laughs> on her. Um, Lisa McIntyre is an academic at the School of Textiles and Design at Heriot Watt University in Scotland. She's been lecturing in textile technology and researching medical compression garments for more than 20 years. She was awarded her PhD in pressure garments for hypertrophic scar treatment in 2004, and she won best paper at the BBA that same year for that same topic. While most of her research into compression has focused on burn scars, she's also worked on DBT prevention, scoliosis, and she's currently doing research into compression for lipedema. She's a member of the UK Pressure Garment Interest Group. She's published multiple papers on medical compression. She designed the Pressure Garment Design Tool, which optimises garment construction methods and enables evidence gathering for most effective pressures. And she regularly consults on pressure garment testing and fabric sourcing for UK and international companies. She's undertaken multiple funded research projects. She teaches undergrad and postgrad courses on textiles, product specs, product testing and research methods, and she supervises research uh, projects at all levels. She's been the Director of Research and is currently the School Director of Postgrad Research Study. And she is going to be presenting to us on making pressure therapy consistent. This, se this session is sponsored by Jobskin, um, and I speak on behalf of Adam Ho, who's the Managing Director who would like to be here. Um, but, uh, and Adam would, um, uh, had Adam been here, he, he would be saying that Jobskin's a company that uh, makes custom-made pressure garments and is committed to product development and so is very proud to be uh, sponsoring Lisa's presentation this morning. Thank you. Hello, I'm Lisa McIntyre. I'm a textile technologist, lecturer and researcher in pressure garments for more than 25 years. And ANSBA have very kindly invited me here today to talk to you about making pressure therapy more consistent. I'm going to tell you very briefly about pressure garments and then I'll summarise my research to date and then we'll talk about making pressure therapy more consistent. Pressure garments are normally made to measure elastic garments that are fitted to patients after their wounds are healed and their skin grafts are taken. They're used to minimise the hypertrophic scarring that can frequently occur after serious burns, and they're also used for other medical conditions. They're worn continuously, day and night, until the scars mature, and this can take up to three years, but is often a bit less. Um, and they're made by specialist companies, and sometimes by sewing technicians or therapists in hospitals. And my main message today that I want to get across is that existing pressure garments do not all exert the same pressure, and I'll explain the reasons for that in a moment. All of these papers have reported measuring pressures on patients and all of them report measuring different pressures on patients and sometimes some of the papers range from as little as 5 millimetres of mercury to more than 55 millimetres of mercury where 5 millimetres of mercury is considered to be ineffective therapeutically and 55 millimetres of mercury is too high a pressure to be comfortable, it negatively impacts on patient compliance and also can cause other problems um, to the patient because the pressure is too high. So pressure garments are made smaller than the body that they're designed to fit and the difference between the body dimension and the garments dimension is expressed as the reduction factor. We can make pressure garments using two different methods. So we can either make the pressure garment using a different reduction factor for each body circumference, which is what I'm recommending today, or we can use a single reduction factor for all body circumferences. This example shows a garment made for a leg that had 20% reduction factor on all circumferences. And I'm wanting to show why that's not the best idea. So when worn, the garment will stretch by 25% when it goes on the body at all measurement circumferences. And that will result in a consistent tension on each measurement point in the body. However, because pressure is a function both of tension and of dimension, if the tension is consistent throughout the garment, but the body size changes, then the pressure will change as well. 
So the pressure changes with the body circumference if the tension is constant. And higher pressures are exerted on smaller body parts than on bigger body parts. And in this example, we can see that um, the, the ankle was only about 20 centimetres, the calf was almost 30 centimetres, and the pressure that would be exerted on the ankle was 28 millimetres of mercury, and the pressure exerted on the higher circumference calf was about a third less at 19 millimetres of mercury. So the main variables that determine the pressure exerted by pressure garments are, firstly, the radius of curvature of the person being measured. So the radius of curvature um, impacts on the point pressure at that particular point and for that particular radius. This is very difficult to measure and therefore we use the circumference of the patient to indicate this. The tension profile of the fabric has a big impact on the pressure that is exerted, uh, with every fabric having its own tension profile and some able to deliver more pressure than others, and it has to be measured in a laboratory. And the third factor is the reduction factor. Um, the higher the reduction factor, the higher the pressure will be for any given fabric and any given body dimension. And I'll now give you a little summary of my research to date that gives evidence for all of these. So the first one is the person that's being measured. So this graph shows a, a lot of data taken from two different studies where the points on the black line are all pressures that would be exerted on a 15 centimetre wrist. And the points on the grey line are all pressures that would be exerted by the same fabric made into a pressure garment using a 20% reduction factor, so a similarly made pressure garment, but on a 72 centimetre thigh. And the difference between those two lines indicates the impact of the body dimension on the pressure that is exerted. And you can see that there is a significant difference between each of those pairs of points, the one at the top being for the small wrist and the one at the bottom being for a fairly chunky thigh. Um, and the pressures are very, very different. Now, those are theoretical pressures calculated using the Laplace law. I also have some measured data to show you. So one of the parts of my uh, work in the past has been to actually measure lots of arms and legs and then make up pressure garments and measure the pressures that were exerted. And in one study, I measured lots of different people and three of them happened to have a forearm that was 20 centimetres in circumference at the measurement point and three of them a 25 centimetre circumference at the measurement point. All of the garments were made using a 20% reduction factor in the same fabric, and then the pressures were measured. The mean pressure measured on the 20 centimetre arms was 32 millimetres of mercury, and with only a 5 centimetre increase in the arm circumference, we got a drop of, a, on average, a third in the pressure, and in some cases more. So the second factor affecting the pressure of pressure garments is the tension profile. Each fabric has its own unique tension profile. And we can see here five fabrics that are currently used to make pressure garments, all tested under identical conditions. PowerNet 2 exerts more than twice the pressure, having more than twice the tension compared to PowerNet 1 and 3, even though they all look broadly similar and are all made from nylon and elastane. We also have on this graph two sleek knit fabrics that look like this. And these fabrics would commonly be used to exert lower pressures on patients. But we can see here that uh, sleek knit 2 would actually exert more pressure than power nets 1 and 3. And this rams home the fact that we really ought to test our fabrics in order to make the best possible quality garments. We also have different batches of fabrics exerting slightly different tensions and pressures on patients. These five fabrics here are all made from identical specifications. They may be different batches and they're also different colours. And the dye conditions that are used to get these different colours will have an impact on the tension profile of the fabric. Now, although these tension profiles are much more similar because it's the same specification of fabric, we can see that they still have significant differences, even in the range of 20 to 40 percent extension. In this example, a garment made using a 20 percent reduction factor from Royal would exert 25 percent more pressure than an identically made garment made from the beige fabric. 
The third variable to affect the pressure of pressure garments is the reduction factor, and this one is perhaps the most obvious. This graph here is taken from my PhD, which I did years ago, and shows a linear relationship between the reduction factor used to make samples and the measured fabric tension um, that it results, and therefore the pressure that would result from these. And the, so the higher the, the reduction factor, the higher the pressure for any given fabric and body dimension. Since the dimensions of the human body that we're going to treat is fixed, and we're going to pick a single fabric, then the pressure can only be controlled by using the appropriate reduction factor for each body circumference. So we can calculate this. Firstly, you need to decide what your target pressure is. The target pressure should be within the range of 20 to 30 millimetres of mercury, as uh, recommended by Sharp in, in their most recent best evidence paper. Secondly, we identify the tension that we need to to deliver that desired pressure at each point on the body using the Laplace law. Then we look at the tension profile of the fabric in order to find the fabric extension required to generate the particular tension that we need. And lastly, we convert the fabric extension to a reduction factor for each body circumference. This is quite complicated to do manually, it takes a long time, and therefore we can automate that process using a thing like the PGD tool. So there's overwhelming evidence that using the same reduction factor for different patients and different parts of the same patient and for different fabrics will not result in the same pressure being exerted on patients. However, many pressure garment companies and in-house providers of pressure garments still use a standard reduction factor for all parts of the body. They sometimes will use a lower reduction factor, perhaps for newly healed scars or for children or for the finger tubes of gloves but it's not subtle enough. And so the pressure that the garment is designed to exert is not always known or recorded, even when a Laplace law system is being used. Further, the pressure is not routinely measured clinically because it's incredibly time consuming, it's far too expensive, and existing sensors don't actually work properly on small circumference limbs or on tight radii of curvature. And therefore, it's likely that lots of research studies reporting the efficacy of pressure garment have not taken into account the different doses of pressure that are being used when making the pressure garments. And that leads to conflicting or insufficient evidence. So in summary, if the pressure is not routinely measured and methods of making pressure garments commonly result in the delivery of either inconsistent or unknown pressures, but practitioners and others assume that all pressure garments deliver the right pressure, then it's unsurprising that researchers looking for evidence of efficacy find insufficient evidence for several aspects of pressure therapy. Now we've been doing this for 50 years and we can carry on, but if we're not happy with this situation, then there is a solution. All pressure garments could be made using garment dimensions that are calculated using the Laplace law and the measured tension profile of the fabric. Some companies already do this using either their own design system or my PGD tool, and anybody can use a PGD tool or develop their own system based on the Laplace law and tested pressure pro tension profiles of fabrics. If the initial mean pressure exerted by every pressure garment was known, then every burns unit would be in a position to gather evidence for best practice. And if we pulled all of that together, then we would have a much better understanding of what pressures deliver what outcomes um, for the patients. In order to do this, prescribers would need to demand garments that exerted a pressure in the recommended range and be sure that the the garments that were being supplied to them actually did deliver those pressures and we would find that out by asking good questions. Pressure garments uh, makers and manufacturers would need to test each new batch of fabric that they intend to use and as I say some manufacturers already do this and once they've tested the fabric they would need to build the fabric's tension profile into their garment design and production system either using their own CAD system or a PGD tool. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, you're welcome to contact me after this presentation by email. Um, you can find copies of all my papers on ResearchGate and I'll be along in a moment live um, in order to answer any questions that any of you might have. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye.
Thank you, Lisa. And we've actually got Lisa back online, so we're going to take a couple of minutes now um, if anyone has any questions. Any questions in the room? Hi, Lisa. My name is Dale Edwick. I'm one of the physios in Perth. Uh, wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, I was interested to see that uh, within the same material with different dyes uh, affected a different pressure. Now, understanding that uh, you know, patient preference for a colour will make them more compliant with wearing the pressure, uh, pressure garments, um, would you be inclined to sort of, I guess, guide the patient towards the optimum uh, colour in terms of maintaining the pressure or would, uh, would you uh, prefer them to be more compliant with wearing the pressure garment based on their colour choice? Thanks, Dale. Um, no, you should be able to, if the fabrics are all tested, then you, you would be able to deliver any pressure with any fabric. You would just use slightly different reduction factors and something like um, the PG tool or if it was built into um, the company's own um, CAD system, that could easily be calculated. You just need to, to know what the tension profile of the fabric is in order that that can all be taken into account in the design process. So the patient would still have full choice and any initial pressure could be requested, um, assuming that the, the, the tension profile of the fabric allowed that, but it should be possible. Uh, hello, Dr. McIntyre. This is Blair from Perth speaking. Um, so you talk a lot, lot about the initial uh, garment pressure, uh, but I imagine that different fabrics are going to lose tension at different rates over time. Do you think there needs to be a, uh, if we want to standardize the initial pressure, do we also need to standardize the, uh, the length of pressure that is maintained by the garment? And at what point do you think, <coughs> oh, excuse me, at what point do you think garments need to be uh, replaced so that the pressure is maintained for whatever period that the patient needs? Um, so thank you for the question. The, it, it can all be measured. Um, generally speaking, if, the, if, the, if it's a good quality fabric from um, a reputable supplier, then the, although there is a difference in the tension drop off and therefore the pressure drop off between fabrics is not as big as you might imagine. The, the, the pressure reduction is quickest, um, is, is greatest, sorry, in the very first moments of wearing the garment. So after the garment's been worn for about five minutes, it actually levels out reasonably consistently. And if the, if, if the garment is machine washed, then it should come back to its, the, its initial pressure. At the moment, because we don't know what the pressures are in the garments, it's impossible to tell when it's no longer effective. So, so it's a kind of a chicken and egg situation um, that's, that's not currently possible to, to answer. But I think that if we, if we were to start, if we were to have better understanding of the starting pressure, then we would be able to monitor the, the efficacy of those pressures and that would give us a better indication of when the garment was was no longer um was no longer as useful as it might be but at the moment it feels to me like we're, we're kind of operating blind in a lot of ways because the pressure is so seldom known <laughs> Lisa, I, I could ask a question um or ask you to make a comment on um, obese patients because we've got progressively increasing BMIs and uh, which means that we are putting garments or not on um, la progressively larger circumferences. Can you make a comment about that, please? Yeah, that, that is really challenging because as the circumference increases, the pressure reduces. So. Um, and when, when you're looking at um, obese circumferences, that becomes incredibly challenging. And so it may be that you have to go to using double layered fabrics in order to get the same pressure profiles. Um, and of course, and that doesn't even start to hit on the fact that, that, that the tissue itself is different um, and will respond differently. But 
um, it is it is very challenging. It's something that we're looking at, um, not for burns, but for lipedema treatment at the moment. Um, and there are all sorts of difficulties in delivering pressures to very large body shapes due to the way the fat deposits around the body. So yes, I, I appreciate that that is really challenging. Um, and in order to get those same pressures that you might get on a slimmer person, you you will need much stronger fabrics or or multi-layered um, garments, which of course then is it makes the garment warmer, which is less comfortable. Um, yeah, so that there are there are real issue, issues there, um, and more work needs to be done. Um, Lisa, thank you so much for joining us at. Uh, Anne's Bar here in Perth. We really appreciate the talk that you've given us and your time, particularly at the time of morning that it is in the UK. Thank you so much. You're very, you're very welcome. Thank you for having me.